Good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're listening from. I'm Robin Prater, the Executive Director of the Lutchens Trust America, and it's my privilege to welcome you to our 30th Lutchens Trust America and Lutchens Trust webinar in the service of Lutchens, a study of Lutchens kitchens, sculleries, and service rooms. And today is a very special webinar as we're featuring William Clark, the winner of our first Lutchens Traveling Fellowship. Marcos Lutchens will introduce William in just a moment, but I'd like to tell you something about our fellowship program first. The purpose of the Lutchens Trust America and the Lutchens Trust in the U U UK is to protect and promote the spirit and substance of the work of Sir Edwin Lutchens. And we're committed to finding new ways to do this. That was the impetus between developing this webinar series and sponsoring our annual trips. So when our, one of our board members, Michael Ember, came approached us with the idea of sponsoring an annual traveling fellowship, he found a great deal of enthusiasm and support from our board and our members. We've just announced the 2024 Lutchens Traveling Fellowship. You can find details on our website, www.lutchenstrustamerica.com. The $7,000 fellowship funds a period of individual travel and research on the work and legacy of Sir Edwin Lutyens and is open to emerging professionals in architecture, art history, interior design, historic preservation, or the decorative arts. I know from my own experience that I find something new and intriguing every time I visit a new Lutyens site and a lot of times when I revisit a site. Our hope is to spark interest and research in the generation of design professionals just beginning their practice so their research can impact their entire career and also spread the word to others. And now let me turn over to Marcus Lutchens, our LTA chairman. Hello, everyone. Um, so I just wanted to introduce William. William Clark is an architect in Chicago, Illinois, uh, born in Memphis, Tennessee. He studied architecture at the University of Notre Dame. After graduating, he moved to New York City, where he worked for firms such as John B. Murray Architects and Roman and Williams. For most of the past 13 years, he has focused on high-end residential architecture. It was his first job in New York City that ignited his appreciation for Sir Edwin Lutyens, thanks to his British boss, Tim Hook of Moran Hook Architecture. During the pandemic, William moved to Atlanta to work for McAlpine Tankersley Architecture. He recently relocated to Chicago to be closer to his friends and family, where he works for Keslow Group and enjoys painting portraits. Welcome. Thank you so much, Marcus. So my proposal was called In Service of Lutchens, a study of Lutchens' kitchens, sculleries, and service rooms. Uh, as Marcos mentioned, I'm a residential architect, uh, and I first learned about Edmund Lutchens back in college. At Notre Dame, they have a strong focus on the Western traditional uh, architecture and very classical architecture. Uh, but it was, as he mentioned, in New York where I really fell in love with his work. Um, as a residential architect, I am always looking for inspiration in general, much has been made of Lutchen's grander rooms, such as his dining rooms and his living rooms. For instance, the ASG Butler retrospective uh, compend uh, compendiums uh, released shortly after his death have numerous interior elevations, but none of the service spaces. I regularly come up short while looking for inspiration and historical references in kitchens and sculleries and pantries. When I saw that the Lutyens Trust of America was starting a traveling fellowship, I jumped at the opportunity. I am an American and I have limited vacation time and opportunity to visit Europe, especially for an extended period of time. This was really once in a lifetime experience. And I wanna start off by thanking the Lutyens Trust of America uh, for awarding me the fellowship and for the opportunity that this provided. Um, So as part of my proposal, I visited five different homes by Edwin Lutyens. Um, I started up north in Scotland and I went to Lindisfarne Castle and Grey Walls. And then I flew down to Exeter so that I could visit Castle Drogo, one of his largest homes that he built. Um, and then I capped it off by going to London where I was able to take commuter trains to both Goddard's and Munstead Wood. 
While in London, I was also able to visit the Victorian Albert Museum, which houses the archives for the Royal Institute of British Architects. And they allow people to see and handle uh, Lutchen's original presentation drawings that they have there. You just have to give them a week uh, warning in advance. Um, that's not gonna be a part of this, but they also have digitized a huge amount of their archives. And Castle Drogo has also digitized many drawings that they have. So if you're interested, feel free to look online. Um, one thing I want to say about visiting these homes is that they have provided me an experience that photographs and even videos can't replicate. Um, and being able to experience the space in three dimensions, both the way it looks, the way the sunlight comes in, and the way that the the physical flow through the space, it's just not something that can be replicated purely through photographs. But I hope that I can give you a sense of these spaces in this presentation. Uh, for my friends and family and any random YouTubers that find this later, I just wanted to set the scene. Edwin Lutyens is considered by many uh, the greatest British architect. It depends who you ask, but I would agree with them. He lived from 1869 to 1944, so basically born during the Victorian era and then passed during World War II. Uh, and he's considered by many somewhat of a child prodigy. Technically, he started his firm at uh, 19, although his big commissions came in his later 20s. He worked in both the arts and crafts style and very classical styles. And you may recognize his work from the World War I Cenotaph that's near um, Downing Street in Whitehall, London, New Delhi, uh, the British uh, colonial capital in India, and then his just so many country homes that he did that really started his career. There should be a place for everything and everything in its place. This is a quote uh, from Isabel Beaton or possibly Benjamin Franklin. I included it uh, because Isabel Beaton wrote the book, Mrs. Beaton's Book of Household Management, which was basically the Martha Stewart of the Victorian era. This was a guide that lots of people read, uh, referenced, and is still actually in print. But the reason I include it is because more traditional homes tended to have more compartmentalized and separated spaces. Um, I want to give a brief rundown of some of these to set the scene before we look at each of them. So historically, especially in Lutchen's time, the kitchen was a separate room where all the cooking and prep work for the food went. Uh, in larger homes, this was its own separate space. In smaller homes, it might be combined or it might be uh, a single room in lower class homes. Um, the scullery is the term for the wet room. This was usually a small room immediately adjacent to the kitchen where they washed dishes, uh, left dishes to dry and sometimes stored them and they could do other wet prep work. The butler's pantry was a more formal storage room. It's usually more beautiful and it was the transitional space between the served area, which was the family of the home and the service, which was the cooks, uh, et cetera. So a lot of food plating, dishwashing happened here, as well as some of the uh, china and silver storage. Um, often if there was a lot of silver, they would have a safe attached to the butler's pantry. And then as far as storage, there were a few different types of rooms. There are larders, which was mainly for storing and preparing meat, as well as some cold prep, such as uh, various pastries, things that needed cold service to work on. And then there were pantries, which are very similar to the way we understand them now. It's just dry food storage. Um, and then there are fuel rooms. These stoves of the time were heavily, uh, they all used either wood or coal. And so they had to have rooms where they could store massive amounts of the wood and coal in order to use it. And often, including in many of the homes that we'll be looking at, these fuel rooms were right on the outside of the building so that the people delivering the coal or the wood wouldn't have to track through the house. And they'd either have a door or possibly just a chute that opened into that room. If you compare that to kind of the popular modern kitchens that we see, there's been a lot in the past, I don't know, 50 years uh, pushing towards open concepts. These open concepts make sense uh, in terms of entertaining and some modern family uh, organizations, especially uh, when working mothers, for instance, want to be able to prepare food while still enjoying their time with their family. Or I include Ina Garden here because some people enjoy uh, performative entertaining uh, to their friends and family. But 
other than that, I kind of feel as an architect that it's it's worse in almost every other way. Uh, the lack of the compartmentalization means that all of your functions bleed into each other. In addition, uh, kitchens in Lutchen's time were very carefully thought of locationally so that they wouldn't share uh, walls with larders, mainly the stove and any chimney flues, because they didn't want to bring any additional heat into those storage spaces. Uh, in addition, as we know now, there's a lot of smoke and grease and uh, flammables that come off while we're cooking. And not having the kitchen in a separate space means that that's landing all over you, all of your furniture, everything. Um, so I, I am a fan of kind of separating these spaces and I'll show you, I believe Lechian's clearly was as well. And then finally, I like rooms and I think they're more fun when we have more of them and can try even more interior uh, finishes. As you can see, they're hugely popular. I want to give a brief rundown of the sort of domestic staff that Lutchens would have designed his spaces around. Um, back in 1900, there were over a million domestic laborers in the UK. I've seen figures of 1.2, and I also saw maybe 1.5 million. But regardless, it was over 4% of uh, the population. So it was a massive of the working population. It was a massive amount of people. And then you compare that to now, for instance, in 2012, they did a study and only found 65,000 domestic laborers. Well, what's changed since his time to ours has been industrial and technological revolutions. I mean, they didn't have dishwashers, refrigerators, uh, clothes washers. These have completely changed the way that um, kitchens are laid out and thought about. Um, and more importantly, have reduced the amount of staff that anyone needs. In my own experience, I've worked in high-end residential uh, on some very expensive projects. The most, none of the staff is live-in. All of the staff back in Lutchen's time was live-in. Now they tend to be hired and at most at full time, they come in and then they leave at the end of the day. Um, so the sleeping rooms and arrangements that Lutchen's designed are no longer necessary even for the wealthiest clients. Um, so this the staff would have been um, considered above stairs versus below stairs. This is a concept that uh, has been explored in a lot of pop culture, like Downton Abbey, Remains of the Day, Gosford Park. But basically, above stairs is the served area, and that's the owner of the home and his family. And then in a larger staffed house, they would have various uh, managers of the entire staff who are considered either like the butler or the head housekeeper, and they would interact with the family and with the staff. But then everyone below stairs is basically everybody else, the maids, the cleaners, the cooks, and the valets. Um, they were, it depended on who, what family they worked for, but they were often, the homes were designed to keep the service completely separate from the served. So we'll see in some of these designs ways in which the home was arranged so that the domestic staff would not be seen or interact with the family in the public part of the house. Um, so for instance, these are some of the houses that I visited and a rough idea of the staff at them. Uh, Lindisfarne Castle was the smallest, it's a vacation home. Um, and there was a single manservant and then his wife occasionally helped as a housekeeper. And Munstead Wood, Gertrude Jekyll's home, she had a full-time housekeeper and a cook. Goddard's is an interesting house. It was originally built as a charitable holiday home for working women. So it did have a housekeeper and cook at that time, but then it was renovated for the family later uh, and they may have had a different staff. And then when I was at Castle Drogo, I met with Bunny uh, who, used to live, who still lives at Castle Drogo, but lived there with her family um, uh, after the height. So with a somewhat reduced staff, uh, but they had at the time, one butler, one housekeeper, four gardeners, an under parlor maid, a cook, a night watchman, a chauffeur, and a separate laundry. The cook probably had other cooks that helped him, um, especially before Bunny's time back in the 1930s when it was running with a full staff. Okay, so the first home that I visited is also the first home in this presentation. It's Lindisfarne Castle. Uh, this is located on Holy Island in off the coast of Scotland. 
it's separated from the coast by a uh, tidal causeway. So you can actually only get on and off a few times a day. It's very remote and very exposed to the elements. The island originally had uh, an abbey and priory dating back to the 600s, which was abandoned in the 1550s uh, when King Henry VIII took over. Uh, he kind of shut down all the monasteries. And then they, shortly after, in 1500s, they built this castle because it was still an important harbor, uh, and this was used as a fortification for that harbor. There's a wonderful Legends Trust of America webinar by Nick Lewis about the castle and the renovation that goes much more in depth. These are the floor plans. Um, hopefully you can see my mouse. Uh, down at the bottom right, this is where you actually enter. The photo before was the backside of the castle here. So you kind of come up and then back around and then back up uh, into the entry. The entry takes you into a beautiful entry hall. And then immediately to your left is the kitchen, the pantry, uh, storage and butler's pantry. The Castle was purchased by um, Edward Hudson, who was the founder and editor of Country Life magazine. He first saw it in about 1901 and thought it would make an amazing holiday home. Uh, he was introduced to Edwin Lutyens through Gertrude Jekyll, the landscape architect, um, and basically hired him to renovate the castle. You can tell from this plan there were, uh, it's a somewhat surgical renovation. Uh, the on the right, the gray poche is the existing and the darker blacker poche is the new. So Lutchens reworked the fenestration and windows and then reworked a couple bays. But as far as the kitchen goes, um, he basically just arranged it more cleanly uh, into an existing floor plan. And in 1912, they actually re-renovated and added these bedrooms, the three bedrooms you can see at the top. Um, and at the same time, they moved the kitchen wall further down into the kitchen in order to make the entry hall grander. So they cut some of the space and they increased the distance from the kitchen to the dining room. The kitchen was about 50 feet from the dining room uh, in this case. That's again, a result of the existing plan. Uh, as far as the square footages go, the scullery is one of the smallest I've seen uh, on my trip. It was um, really just big enough for a person to work and then add some shelves for storage. And then immediately adjacent is the larder slash storage. However, that was kind of a leftover space that sits above a uh, stair that goes down below the entry battery. And then on the left, you can see there's what was called a butler's pantry in the original plan. However, um, it was not, it's not built out the way that we'll see all of our other butler's pantries and it's not used as an intermediate space between served and service. I believe it's more of a mixed use uh, servants room that we'll see at like Goddard's for instance. This is Jack and Hannah Lilburn. Jack Lilburn was the main uh, manservant of the castle. And when Edward Hudson eventually sold it, he asked that Jack be kept on because he liked him so much and, and wanted to help him out. Hannah is his wife who also helped. Um, there are some anecdotes of Jack literally having to carry guests from over that tidal causeway I mentioned. So it's quite integral to the experience of this house. Oh, by the way, just to set, this is the fireplace that we see and the curved bench that we see here. This is a modern photo of the kitchen as it looks now. Uh, the trust that runs it has, has kind of added a lot of props to make it look just like you would expect back in 1900s. Um, there is a built-in cupboard on the right and a freestanding bench on the left. And then you can see the doors to the scullery and to the butler's pantry behind that curved bench. Uh, this is a close-up of that built-in cabinet. I wanted to call attention to a few of the details that Legends included. They are somewhat innovative and he always takes a real clever approach to everything from the smallest detail to the biggest. So I think it's great to see these for reference. Uh, one, the first are these two doors flanking the central bay. They have these kind of diagonal slats that actually step back uh, at an angle, and then they have a half round that curves forward. Uh, they also have very high handles. That's what these wood knobs are. Um, those are over four feet off the ground. 
And then the other item that I wanted to call attention to is the shelving. He frequently will push the shelving narrower at the lower and then bring it wider up top so that he maintains the working space at the countertop, but allows depth for larger pots and pans up top. And this is just um, a careful eye to the detail of the ergonomics and reality of using this cupboard that I think uh, carries through to a lot of Lutchen's work. And then we see in the central bay, a much more classical uh, drawer front and a very classical column. Um, he does tend to use simple beads to frame openings, but there's a little more detail below that wraps this. It's all in all somewhat transitional, but feels very prescient of Art Deco styles to come. Here's a view looking into the scullery and the larders. On the left is the actual sink with the countertop um, and drying racks. At first glance, it seems quite small and maybe a little mean, but really it's all that one manservant would need. Jack would be, have been able to uh, reach everything. Like it's it's all right there at your hands, the drying racks, the sink, and the only window in the entire room is centered right on the sink, allowing as much daylight into the working space as possible. The larders here are really leftover spaces. Um, and the trust has again, decorated it to show you what it might've looked like at the time. A recurring detail that's not necessarily cabinetry, but I thought was beautiful uh, is Lutchen's doors. They all tend to be three planks wide, sometimes five. And on the front or the more visible side, they never have top and bottom rails. They just run vertically and then they're cut off at the top and bottom um, with a profile joining them. And then on the back side, he has horizontal and diagonal rails, which actually connect them all together. Uh, the wood is thin, it's about one inch thick. So opening the door feels quite different from modern doors. Um, and then he also tends to put the handles very high. This does come from a Victorian tradition where they would put elaborate ironwork up higher so that your eye was able to see it. This is in a lot of, not here, this is this is a very uh, simple but beautiful shape, but the tradition comes from people spending their money on those expensive iron workings and wanting to be able to show them off. So we see it in both the kitchen door and the more elaborate door towards the dining room. This is the entry and dining room. Uh, the dining room was existing. It's It was part of the fortifications uh, and it's basically just been redecorated. The entry hall, this is the renovation I mentioned in 1912, I believe. Um, and I wanted to call attention to this lovely column detail that you can see in the lower left. The base is curved and runs flush to the floor, but there is no corner or joint for dirt or soot to get stuck in. It's a, it's a quite a convenient and hygienic uh, design, especially for the fact that this fireplace is open to the floor. And in fact, it's a, that sort of coved base is something that we see in hospitals. Uh, so it's clearly useful and timeless. Uh, I included this just to show you that um, Lutchens may have been referencing the island itself when he was uh, designing some of those columns. This is the abandoned abbey. Uh, and then another fun thing I saw was they, it's a very important harbor and they actually use overturned old boats as storage sheds, uh, very similar to kind of how we use shipping containers these days. It's just a fun repurposing that I think uh, speaks to like this presentation and what we can do with old buildings. During my time on this trip, I spent a lot of time measuring and drawing whenever I could. So I've included some drawings showing the type of work I was doing. Um, the I did both measured drawings and freehand sketches, and then I threw some of them into CAD just to get a better grasp of it. If anyone's interested, I'll, I'm happy to share these with you. Um, and then this was a watercolor I was able to do from my hotel room with a beautiful view towards the island, um, as well as another door detail. So by coincidence, but also uh, for this presentation, Gray Walls was the second place I visited it in the second house on this presentation. Um, it was built in, oh, whoops. Apologies. Uh, the problem with Gray Walls, it was built in 1901 for Alfred Littleton, 
But in 1948, it was completely renovated to be a hotel. And eventually a full service wing was added. So very little of the original service space exists. Um, to be honest, the, one of the main reasons I wanted to go to Gray Walls uh, is because it's a beautiful home and hotel, but also uh, I had plans to meet uh, a fellow there, but unfortunately could not. This is the beautiful entry wall. It's a, it's a big curved wall for the, that the motor court enters into, um, which is located right here in this plan. Uh, I do want to describe the plan of gray walls because I think that it's it's relevant to the rest of the plans that we see. Um, over on the far left, you can see these two fuel rooms in this boots slash mud room. This is actually the service entry, and it still is the service entry for the hotel. Um, you can see that they have two fuel rooms with exterior doors, like I mentioned earlier, for hygiene. Um, they also have this open yard here, which... It allows Lutchens to bring daylight into the kitchen without penetrating the courtyard wall. So this kitchen is kept kind of visibly separate from this popular main entry, but um, it still he still needs to bring daylight in. So he creates this element in order to do that. Then we have a scullery as well as some servants rooms and the butler's pantry and then the dining room at the end of that hallway. Um, Oh, sorry. The uh, you can see here the separation of spaces. Um, the kitchen is separated by both a corridor and a covered walkway from the larders. Uh, the larders organization uh, is very similar to what we'll see in the rest of the presentation. They're usually big enough for about one person to walk in, and then he wraps the walls with shelving and he separates the larders into smaller. Uh, smaller divisions at every opportunity. So there's three separate ones here with a ton of shelving. Um, the scullery is about one third the size of the kitchen, uh, which is a recurring theme. And the pantry is roughly the same size. This is the interior of gray walls uh, as it looks now, just to give you an idea of, of the space. Um, and then these are some drawings I did since there wasn't much time to measure or uh, anything really to examine as far as service. I spent a lot of time um, just examining the exteriors. And here is a uh, watercolor that I was able to do um, on site. So Goddard's is another home uh, by Lutchens. It was built for the shipping magnet Frederick Mirelees in, in 1898. Uh, this is the home that I mentioned was originally built as a vacation home for uh, ladies of low means, but basically uh, villagers and such. Um, but then in 1910, it was expanded and connected for the family uh, that owned it. Now it's a rental for the Landmark Trust in the UK. So if you want, you could actually rent this home and sleep in it. Uh, and it's also... Um, owned by the Lutchens Trust in the UK and leased out to them. So they have some of their storage there in a small book shop. This is post renovation. Uh, I'm gonna focus on what it looks like for the family. So this is uh, the plan of Goddard's. Uh, it has been connected uh, by this common room and then he expanded it with these fireplaces. Um, I actually entered the same way that a uh, servant may have entered at the time. There is a parking lot off on the side of the right side of this shed where uh, I entered and walked through the covered shed and then came around to where this kind of fuel and scullery is. This is an open air patio uh, with doors to each of these rooms. The scullery opens immediately into the kitchen uh, and then the kitchen leads to the servant's hall and to the, the pantry, which has a direct opening to the dining room. And you can see that there are walls and doors separating the main corridor from this circulation so that they were able to be kept separate from the served spaces um, and still be able to access the dining room to deliver food or whatever. Um, so here's a more blown up version of the plan. The scullery is a, now a entry and a WC for the Landmark Trust, uh, but it is about a third the size of the kitchen. The kitchen is 15 foot four wide 
which uh, is a very gracious dimension in that it allows you to have two two-foot counters and a three-foot table and still maintain two four-foot wide walkways between them. Here in Goddard's, they've added a much larger table, uh, but I wanted to bring that up because we'll see it again at Munstead. Uh, the servants hall now is a secondary dining room, but at the time it would have been a multifunctional space for dining, for uh, chores, for prepping food. And then the pantry has been closed off from the original ASG Butler plan and is now kind of a um, uh, washer, dryer, laundry room for the, Nash or the Landmark Trust. The separation of the circulation still exists though, and the fuel and larders largely remain as they were. They've been repurposed for generic storage now rather than food storage. These are photos looking into those larders and fuel rooms. Um, a couple of things I wanted to note. One is you can kind of make out on the photo on the right that there are stone shelves. Uh, these were traditionally called thralls and the stone helped maintain the cold temperature and uh, the if you're storing or preparing food on it. Uh, and then in addition on the left, you can see this thick masonry support uh, and you can kind of make it out on the right as well. These also helped um, uh, maintain temperatures in these rooms. Uh, I do wanna call attention to the gracious uh, window designs. You know, they're not particularly large, but Lutchens went out of his way to give them designs. The H-shaped uh, leaded window in the middle faces that garage that I entered through. So there's truly no one seeing that that would have been part of the served. Uh, this was just for the, the service entry people to see, but he still put the effort in uh, to decorate it. And then on the right is a diamond-shaped leaded, slightly more elaborate version um, that faces the family entry. This is the kitchen as we see it now. It has new cabinets and a new stove in the old uh, existing location. That fireplace is where the stove would have been. Uh, you can see on the far left, there is one huge wall of windows. Lutchens really maximized as much of that wall as he could. It is the only window in this space. And then on the right is the laundry that used to be the pantry. And we can see a glimpse of a very similar door uh, to Linda's farm. The, this is a cabinet that uh, I believe was existing and designed by Lutchens. Um, the hardware and flush frame looks a little new. So I, I was told that it's existing and I will operate under that assumption. But um, we can see that he is again using that stepping technique, except this time each step moves further forward. Uh, all of these shelves have a uh, a divot along the front that the plates can rest in and then rest against the wall. Another fun detail that I'm not sure if it's Lutchens or the carpenters of the time is these beadboard backs of the cabinets. While walking around the Lutchens houses, I, uh, I was looking at a bunch of new and old cabinets and only the originals seem to have this detail. It's, it's a lovely effect, although I'm not sure what it accomplishes um, as far as construction, but looks good. And then here are some photos of the dining room, including that uh, incredible fireplace in Ingle Nook that he designed on both sides. Uh, to me, I wanted to include this one to show the serve space and two to show again, Lutchen's control of daylighting. This, this huge fireplace nook could have been such a dark and dingy place, but he put two windows on different sides in order to bring different effects of light into the same space. Like it's it's very clever. And this hidden window reminded me of um, the Ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini in Rome, which uh, looks like this and has a hidden skylight above pouring light down in. So it's a very artistic moment by him. And then upstairs, since there wasn't as much existing cabinetry, I wanted to show some, some of the other stuff he did. Um, you can see these doors are a variation on the theme. Uh, he's added iron strapping uh, to the front rather than the exposed studs. However, on the attic door, which was smaller and for a small uh, storage room, he's left it uh, with the exposed studs and less elaborate iron work. So he's always, he's got a language that he creates for these houses and then he keeps playing with them. In addition, Lutchens did design the ironwork uh, and strapping. 
that were on the doors. He often worked with local metal workers to the project. But when you see these things, these are these are all items that Lutchens made deliberate decisions with. And then there's also some fun little colonnettes that I wanted to include that uh, were a little more unique. In here, uh, this is that separate um, staff area. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to show was, again, the layer of the lighting um, and also this detail showing um, the mid rail is actually the same as the backside of the doors, The this mid rail on the right here. Uh, so he's, again, reusing and reinterpreting different things. Um, so at my, my time at Goddard's, I was able to do some more drawings and some watercolors. So I wanted to include those uh, and show you some of the work that I was able to do thanks to the trust. Okay, the fourth home, uh, this is actually the last house I visited. It's another one of these uh, country homes like Goddard's and like Gray Walls that were built. They're all kind of the same scope. So I that's why I included them together. Um, this was built for Gertrude Jekyll, uh, and it was finished in 1897. Gertrude Jekyll has uh, immeasurable impact on Lutchen's career. She was older than him and kind of discovered him and gave him both his first major commissions and introductions uh, to other people that gave him further commissions. There are a few Lutchen's Trust webinars all about both the relationship and Munstead Wood, and they're all fascinating. Uh, their relationship is really unique. And this building especially is a love letter to the vernacular architecture in Surrey, which is the region that this was built. Uh, there are several anecdotes of both Gertrude and Lutchens traveling around by cart um, in Surrey, just kind of like picking out details that they liked, which I happened to notice when I was walking to Munstead Wood from the train station. So I think it'd be great if someone maybe another fellowship or another webinar could go more in depth uh, comparing how Lutchens kind of like pulled references and moved away from them. It'd be, it'd be really great because seeing it in person was, was eye-opening. The plan itself um, is this U shape, but it's actually a kind of a W. Uh, there is the grander shape of it around this giant garden court, but then there's a smaller U-shaped uh, wing that is entirely the service wing built around this open air yard. This is a covered entry to that yard. Um, this both allows light into the kitchen and pantry and creates a local organizing center. The uh, kitchen was quite gracious. We have another 15 foot ish kitchen. Um, as well as a scullery that's about a third the size of the kitchen again, and the same sort of breakups of uh, larders that we would see everywhere else. The pantry was on the other side, uh, as well as a safe attached to it. And then the dining was immediately adjacent, uh, or not immediately, sorry, it was on the other side of two different corridors. Um, the kitchen does have lighting from both sides, although the pantry does not. This was also used as her main entry for uh, gardening. The, the, a lot of these rooms, like opposite the WC, was actually a shed for garden equipment. This is that staff yard that I mentioned. Um, this is the kitchen on the left and the pantry on the right. But in addition, Lutchens has added these wonderful windows down into the stair leading to the cellar. There is no decoration in the cellar. These windows are just adding natural daylight to a storage space. Um, and then also there is a coal chute for the fuel rooms, which in this house were in the cellar. Those are hidden by this uh, access ramp, though. Uh, and then I wanted to include some of the like exterior doors that Lutchens did. He's, he's, again, just kind of playing with themes, um, adding windows, making them smaller, changing, like, all in one elevation. There's so much movement, but it's all very cohesive. 
this is the kitchen as it stands now. Munstead Wood is in a somewhat transitional time. It was recently bought by uh, the National Trust and they're trying to figure out what to do with it. So this was previously privately owned up until then. And this is the renovation that a prior owner had done. I think it's interesting that they have added a wall um, here where this fridge is, but otherwise the kitchen is entirely intact because the size and shape of it and the um, position of the windows and daylighting are just, uh, you don't need to add anything. They didn't need to change anything. All they had to do was add cabinetry into this space in order to modernize it, um, which I speaks to the graciousness and the like intelligence with which Lutchens designed the home, but also to uh, some of the timelessness that we can find in design in terms of dimensions, uh, heights, and just relationships with the human body. Um, these are some other shots, uh, a couple from the larders. Uh, the larders had a fun detail where the flooring um, followed the function of the room. So you can see these uh, black tiles are actually the walkways, whereas the red tiles were in the original plan where some of the shelving was. Um, that's on the right there. And then in the middle is a punched window, uh, very similar to the other larders we've seen. He likes to keep them small. I think it helps with uh, heat retention and solar infiltration. Uh, here he used a like quarry tile sill, which was unique. And then on the left, the same kind of horizontal and diagonal rails and styles, this time with a much more pronounced chamfer that gives it this kind of rounded effect um, as it moves down. So unfortunately, most of the kitchen was uh, renovated and replaced. And so I wanted to include this shot of the upstairs at Munstead Wood. This is the bedroom corridor. Gertrude Jekyll uh, is a big fan of objects, beautiful objects, plates, et cetera. And so we built this for her as a display cabinet. And you can see these alternating depths, uh, widths, and the same sort of uh, divots for the plate stores that we've seen elsewhere or photos or whatever. Um, it's a very carefully thought out piece of millwork. And it's likely that given some of the construction drawings I saw and the notes on it, that she knew in advance what she was putting where and that he designed it at least partially with that in mind. Uh, these are some of the measured drawings I was able to do at Munstead Wood. It was a pretty messy day there, so I didn't get much um, site drawing as I might have otherwise. The third home I visited and the inspiration for this entire proposal is Castle Drogo. This was started in 1911 for Julius Drew, who founded Home and Colonial Stores. Edward Hudson, the owner of Lindisfarne Castle from the beginning, actually introduced them. Uh, Julius Drew wanted a true British castle, and there is an incredible webinar about this by Tom Kligerman and Anki Barnes. Um, they compare it to the American Biltmore. It was also a war orphanage during World War II, um, and it set out. Uh, it's it's set out in the wilds, and it's just an incredible place to visit if you get the chance. This is an early iteration of the design. This is not what was built. Uh, Lutchens originally presented this kind of two wing idea. Uh, up top, we see uh, the chapel and some other rooms, uh, and then down below is a service wing that was set under uh, underground into a terrace. The plan changed in that they got rid of this upper wing, but this plan that you see as drawn, uh, kind of pixelated here, actually did not change hardly at all to what is now existing. The butler's pantry, the kitchen, the scullery, and the larders, they're all in the same place. Even their niches are roughly in the same place. Uh, the, the service entry is up towards the top of this uh, plan. This is where people would have delivered vegetables, dropped off uh, deliveries, food, et cetera. It's also where I entered the building. You walk down several stores to get to the subterranean level. As you're coming by, you walk past this octagonal uh, light well for the larders, and then you enter the scullery, uh, and pass through the kitchen. Lutchens is having a lot of fun shifting axes here off center and then back on center. It makes it 
it takes this very rectangular plan and makes it quite a different experience. Not maze-like by any means, but it really just pulls you back and forth. And then seeing it in plan, you're like, oh, that was so, that was so clean. I can't believe it. Um, the scullery and kitchen in this case are roughly the same. They're both absolutely massive because of the much larger staff that this home had. And the butler's pantry was quite separate. The walk from the kitchen to the dining room was 110 feet. Uh, Bunny, who I spoke to, who had lived here with her family, uh, said that sometimes the food would get cold on the walk, uh, which I totally believe. It's quite a hike. Um, one of the most important elements of the Castle Drogo service spaces is their daylighting. Uh, Lutchens took very careful care uh, to introduce multiple layers of daylighting, both because the workers needed it, but also because it's just a humane design. Uh, the castle does have electricity and it did have electricity included during its construction, but it wasn't really thought of in the initial stages. So this daylighting is the most important part for maintaining workable spaces for the servants. Um, on the left, we see a beautiful lantern uh, that is centered on a famous table. Uh, the Scullery has these two giant thermal windows that look like uh, Roman bath windows, and uh, they're perpendicular to the walkway, and they both shine directly on the drying racks and sinks, which you can see the top of right there. And then the larders have this lovely octagonal light well. So all of the light going into the larders is very indirect, but it's an incredible architectural uh, element for a storage room. I mean, these rooms these, the family were not going in here. Even the servants were not spending much time in here. They were purely storage. And he went out of his way to build this octagonal shape. It's, a, it's a, an amazing experience. And um, the light in all of these spaces is so unique and different and uh, just lovely. Here's the kitchen itself. Uh, we see the famous table. Uh, we also see how he uses niches. Um, such as these to create symmetry, but then infill it with cabinetry that's asymmetrical and responds to the functions needed. Uh, this table uh, has inspired many. It's currently being reproduced by Candia Luchens. Uh, so if you're interested, she's out there. And it's, it's very famous both for its size and for its beauty. Uh, here's a close up of the um, millwork. The, uh, he uses these break fronts and these columns and uh, in order to kind of make it appear as if it's furnished rather than all just one single piece of cabinetry. Uh, this allows like some breakup and some local symmetries that he wouldn't have been able to achieve otherwise. And in addition, the shelves again step forward as they move up. This is the scullery. The uh, scullery's at the time often had one wood sink and one porcelain sink. The wood sink was for uh, precious china the wood was much softer and you could wash in there without as much fear of breaking, whereas the pots and pans could have been washed in the porcelain harder sink. You can also see some uh, slats that have been carved into the countertop in a, in a way that allows the uh, water to drain back into the sink. And this also is one of the largest uh, drying racks I've ever seen with some incredibly beautiful detailing. They have these weird little bat wing things that hold the canted uh, supports for the plates, and then also a beautiful scroll with uh, some crazy detailing on the underside here, uh, all for a kitchen drying rack. Here we see another one of these uh, niches with a completely different function. He has kept this coved detail that gets cut at the top at all of the niches. Uh, it's got this crazy little pyramidal shape as well. And then we see here a flush column base, just like we saw in Castle Lindisfarne, which is perfect for hygiene uh, and for sweeping in such a messy place. Uh, I wanted to focus a little bit on these table legs. He has a few variations of them, but they're all very similar and based off of a dining table that he built for himself. Unfortunately, these bottom rails were on that dining table and made it difficult to sit at, but they're wonderful for a working kitchen table. They're rounded at the top so that they don't collect dust, flour, or sugar, and they have uh, a beautiful heft to them that I think really contributes to the quality of the space. In addition, Lutchens, while looking at his construction drawings, I was able to see that he very specifically 
dimensions both the projection and size of these exposed tenons. This is a very like typical arts and crafts detail. And it was nice to see how much thought that he put into like the location and the size. Uh, and these are some nursery bars. This is another item that he um, uh, basically was just reinterpreting and reusing, not in the kitchen, but just contributing to some of the way that um, he designs. Here we see some photos of the larders. Uh, they all have uh, the stone thralls, the shelves that I mentioned, as well as open air lattices. Uh, and all of the doors that I've shown you, most of them are built on four by four wood uh, posts and beams that are set within a masonry opening, uh, not, an ex not a like hidden drywall jam like we might see today. Uh, so it's an additional layer of articulation and design that we can used to contribute to the space. This is the butler's pantry. You can see it's uh, quite ornate and beautiful. It's very symmetrical, but within the symmetries, he's got lots of materials playing different games, functions at different millwork, uh, calling for different designs. Um, in addition, this is on the right. This is where the butler would have actually stayed. Uh, and then on the left is a door to the safe. Uh, these colonnettes, that are supporting the upper cabinets are all kind of interfering with this function of the counter space. But I think that the counters would have just been used to store plates momentarily as you were taking them out of the upper cabinets and then plating food to take them out. Uh, it's an interesting dynamic. I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't seen other places where he's brought the upper cabinets forward flush with the bottom like that. And then here's the final parting shot of that Butler's pantry, including the call button system that he installed um, so that the butler who was immediately next door would be able to answer to it. That's my presentation. In conclusion, I had a few thoughts, things I kind of learned. Uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about specifically, and I touched on at the beginning, is the separation of functions. You know, why are we fighting nature on this? Uh, different functions call for different requirements and trying to force them all into one open plan or loft inevitably leads to issues of hygiene, both mentally, like auditorily, and just literal hygiene, dust and dirt. In addition, uh, some people may be afraid of, of the renovation requirements down the road once a function is no longer relevant, such as the servants' rooms um, of Legends Times. But I've seen and I've shown photos of how easy it is to renovate these homes into modern uh, spaces. It doesn't take much, and thanks to the graciousness of his floor plans, um, it you can really just replace the cabinetry, and it's still a beautiful, wonderful place to live and work. And secondly, I want to call attention to some of the uh, human nature of his designs. So many of the dimensions that I saw on his millwork uh, are dimensions that we still use today. And it makes sense because the human body has not changed at all, despite you know three or four different technological, digital, industrial revolutions since this time. Um, as such, for instance, the Lindisfarne mil uh, cupboard was two foot nine. ADA requirements ask for two foot 10 high countertops, and your average architect will build one non-ADA at three foot tall. So if anything, Lutchens was a little prescient in lowering it for more accessible uh, usage to older people and more handicapped. Um, the other thing is to consider uh, more gracious spaces in terms of widths. Seeing Lutchens work in person, I realize that he's given much more uh, walk space to his both the servants and the owners of the family than we do in current architecture. And I also have reacquainted myself with the importance of multiple sources of indirect daylight. As such, I think we're, as architects, we should be looking to historical references to relearn the lessons uh, that were taught through you know, blood, sweat, and tears for centuries, and then somewhat forgotten during the modern design revolution. Otherwise, we might end up with, oh, it's not showing up. Well, if any of you have heard of Munger Hall at UCSB, it was uh, an incredibly odd choice and uh, the result of inhumane design where there was no daylight uh, for any of the 4,500 students that were expected to live there, not a single window. Anyways, uh, I wanna thank everybody. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you so much to the Lutchens Trust. Thank you so much to everyone I met at the uh, National Trust in the UK who helped me visit these homes and to, uh, the Landmark Trust as well. So 
thank you. And uh, Robin, if there's any questions. Thank, thank you, William. Um, we, we do actually have a couple of questions and I'll uh, voice them here. Uh, there's Lisa Shire um, asks, do you know the purpose of the angled boards? Um, um, yeah. No, not specifically. I felt that it was a decorative choice because it's definitely not hygienic. Um, and Lutchens does have a habit of, of, of doing very clever, but uh, whimsical uh, choices. So it may have just been a fun idea he wanted to pursue. And then uh, Clive Aslett, the chairman of the Lutchens Trust in the UK, um, says, um, actually uh, passes on a message from Rebecca Lilly, who works for the Lutchens Trust. Thank you, William. A really well presented talk and interesting to see these familiar buildings from a new perspective. I hope your research will be published in written form. You, you are writing something, right? Uh, I Sure. Maybe. <laughs> I can. Um, <laughs> I'd be happy to. By the way, Clive Aslett also has some wonderful webinars through the trust for anyone looking for the next thing to watch. Um, then uh, Richard Breeze, not a, not a question, but uh, the servants' quarters at Gladstone Hall were in the roof space, but have a double roof, so they were able to have daylight from interior windows. Google Map shows the roof well. Lutchens showed a lot of thought for domestic staff. Well, that's reassuring. Yes. I, I may, in several of his houses. Yeah, I may not have touched on it enough, but I expected actually to see these like small, mean little rooms for them to live in. And that was not the case. All of the servants' rooms, like the, the sleeping quarters that I visited, were better than the East Village tenements that I lived in in New York, like, and the dorms that I lived in at Notre Dame. The, these were gracious rooms with beautiful detailing and a lot of daylight. Lutchens truly cared about these people when he was designing. That's reassuring. And um, one more comment, um, uh, sorry, question from James Scott. Beyond what you've said so far, how is this going to change your way of working on kitchens and service spaces? I think um, some of the kind of things I was touching on in the conclusion, one is is more space. You know, we, we often acquiesce to our clients um, cutting space from the back of house-ish in order to give grander living rooms. But having worked in smaller kitchens, both briefly professionally and just with my partner, um, that difference between three feet and four foot walkways is quite a difference when you've got two people trying to work. And then the other thing is layering daylighting. I think I've, as an architect, have become too reliant on one source of daylight. Lutchen's doing all these fun different directions changes the experience of the space and it's something that i want to focus more on in my own designs that's fantastic um and then there was just uh one question from jean le duc um about the approximate size of the kitchen table at castle drogo and i saw that in Lutch in candia luchens's uh furniture um uh, portfolio the table is 72 inches in diameter and 196 centimeters um, but she also is making a smaller table at 48 inches or 122 oh. centimeters. But well, I think I like the, the big one. <laughs> yeah, the, the big one's in, the one in the kitchen. And, um, and Lutch has designed it so it's the same same diameter as the skylight. Right. Yeah. Nice. Um, I think we're running out of time. So um, maybe, Robin, you can say uh, wrap things up. First of all, I just want to thank William for a great presentation, and you've been a wonderful inaugural fellowship member for us, and, and we look to have many years to have you at our events and, and part of our Lutchens Trust America. Thank you all for watching. Um, please, if you know people that might be interested in applying for the 2024 Lutchens Traveling Fellowship, the details are on our website, and you may have already gotten an email about it as well. Uh, and, all, and as always, we encourage you to join the Lutchens Trust America or the Lutchens Trust, depending on where you live. But uh, thank you all for watching, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye.